All right, welcome to Open Your Reality. This is the big interview with Tom Campbell. Now, most of my audience knows of Tom Campbell, doesn't need an introduction, but for those people who don't, Tom is a former NASA physicist. He's a consciousness researcher, and this goes over 40 years, both as a physicist and a consciousness researcher. And he's the author of the My Big Toe Trilogy, which stands for My Big Theory of Everything. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Glad to be here. Well, I'm very glad to have you. I'm honored to have you. Um, you're one of the most amazing people that I could ever interview in the entire world. And now I have you for, you know, maybe two hours and I have a ton of questions I want to ask you, hopefully some that you've never been asked before. And I want to jump into it talking about the LCS, just starting with the larger picture. Now, in your model, the LCS is the larger consciousness system. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, this would be like the primordial consciousness. There, there was one consciousness and as a strategy to evolve its growth, it broke itself off into many different pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, you said that the reason it did that was because it wanted to decrease its entropy. And I was just wondering if it, the consciousness is, is just here, um, why would it have entropy? Um, was there maybe perhaps something outside of it that caused it to have entropy? Is it just, or is it just innate within the system itself that it has entropy? Okay. In, a, in an information system, entropy is randomness okay, in the, in the uh, available bits. In other words, if you have an information system and all of the bits are random, then there is no information. Randomness contains no information. So the way you create information is by taking the bits that are available to you and ordering them in a way that has meaning, that has significance to you, that has pattern, has structure, has, um, um, it, it can be symbolic content or it could just be, you know, patterns, whatever, but it's, it's meaningful, it's significant, then that lowers entropy. So if you start with all bits, um, you know, all the potential bits in the system being random or not being assigned, if you will, just there, but they haven't been assigned any particular thing, then that's how a system gets rid of entropy. It creates information. It creates meaning and content. And as it does, its entropy gets smaller. Now, the reason that it needed to break into all those pieces was because that gave it a lot more possibilities in which it could structure to create meaningful connections, meaningful relationships, if you will. So if you have just one thing, then it can only create so much. It's, it's limited by its own vision and its own understanding. But then if you have two things and they both have free will, now the interactions between those two create another whole set of possibilities. And then if you have thousands or billions of these things and they all have free will and they're all interacting with each other, then the possibilities that that system can, can realize becomes very, very, very large. Consciousness becomes a, a, a social system. And a social system with a large number of independent players in that social system has has immense numbers of possibilities in how it might construct itself. Uh, I have a couple of questions based off your answer. One is you said that the, con the LCS broke itself off into many subsects. We mm -hmm. call them uh, chips off the old block. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to making decisions within the context of the larger consciousness system, or I know we're all unified, but, does the L is the LCS kind of like a separate mind from all of the pieces and it just makes all the decisions or do we have any input as to what it does when it does it? Yeah. If it's working at making the choices that are system choices, then it does that itself. You can think of the, as the LCS is like the operating system. You know, you need an operating system to, to coordinate all the things that the computer can do. Without an operating system, you have all this potential, but none of it is working together. You know, it's, it's not coming together to, to make something, uh, you know, to make the computer useful. 
So the LCS is like the operating system that pulls everything together, sets the rules, sets the protocols, how are we going to talk to each other, uh, <clears throat> you know, does all that. And as long as the choices are at that system level, then it's going to make system level decisions. But if the choices are at a individual level, then we get to make those choices. And of course, there's a, there's a boundary in between where the choices at the individual level impact the system and vice versa. And in which case, um, I suspect we uh, kind of work together on that, but the final system choice would be made by the system, just like the final individual choices are made by the individual. Did the, you said the LCS created physical matter reality for its consciousness pieces mm -hmm. to experience and grow in. In other words, when it broke itself off into many pieces, where did those pieces go? Did it create a physical matter reality first and then put them there? Or did it, they just go off and then it created the physical matter reality? Okay. It had already uh, subdivided itself. You might say taken pieces of itself and partitioned them off into these individuated pieces of consciousness, which is what you and I are. We're, we're, we represent an individual piece of consciousness. So it did that first. And it realized that that was not really evolving as quickly as it would like. And the problem was that there wasn't enough consequences to the choices that were being made. You know, I think of that as like a big chat room. So it had the larger conscious system was the one that kind of created the chat room. And then there's you know, literally uh, millions of individuals in that chat room, but there's very few consequences. Any decision you make doesn't really affect anything too much. I mean, you can chat to one of you know, millions of people and you can trade information, but so what, you know, what's the, you know, what's, what's the meat in the choices? Well, there really wasn't much. So the, so the evolution, which is you evolve because of the quality of your choices. And this is mostly like moral or ethical quality to your choices. And there just wasn't much. So what it did is it, it made the simulation. And the simulation then ran for a while until the simulation created what we call our physical universe. And it had in it avatars or simulated beings in the simulation that uh, made choices. And it, it, what it did then is it let pieces of consciousness play those choices. So in the beginning, the larger conscious system played all the characters itself in this simulation. So they were all NPCs, non-player characters. And then it said, okay, you individuated units of conscious, log on, pick a character, go play it. And once you log on to that character, you get to make all the choices for that character. So as they logged on, the, the larger conscious system let those pieces go to the individual players to make choices for them rather than it make choices for all of them. And eventually, the larger consciousness system makes very few um, choices for individuals. There's very few NPCs. They just are around for very special purposes. Mostly, all of the, all of the individuated units of conscious are playing all of the, the uh, avatars that are available to play in this, in this virtual reality. And it needed to do that because in the virtual reality, you have this very strong rule set. And the strong rule set means that everything is interactive with everything else. You know, we're all in a big interactive virtual reality here. You know, so everything, it's our physics that says, you know, everything's interactive. If I do something, it changes things. You know, like we say, a butterfly flaps its wings over off the you know, the, the uh, west coast of Africa, and it ends up being a, you know, a, uh, a hurricane, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have everything kind of interacting with everything else. And in this kind of a reality, with these rules, there's lots and lots of meaningful decisions, lots of consequences, lots of life and death, you know, uh, uh, just very serious implications of all of the things that we do and how they affect our, ourselves and how they affect other people. So suddenly this becomes a fast track place to be for consciousness, for individual units of consciousness, because decisions are so meaningful that you can really grow here much faster than you could in the big chat room. So mm -hmm. that was kind of why it, it, it did that. This is a, 
evolutionary fast track for consciousness. Right. I'm, I've heard you say that before and it makes complete sense. So I'm wondering where are our IUOCs right now? Are they in like the afterlife where, you know, when we die, it's like, I know we don't go out of body. We're just there. And this, we're experiencing this reality. And then it's like, we're logged out, but we have to kind of reintegrate because it's kind of a shock to our system. But is there in like a, in another uh, PMR that's called like maybe the afterlife where all the IUOCs and think, is that, is that valid to say? No, it's not, it's not so much like that. Um, think of these IUOCs as little partitioned off pieces of the larger consciousness system. So you, you don't have to make it in your mind. Uh, each one is a, is a separate thing, you know, independent of the larger whole. It's not independent of the whole. We are the, you know, the whole, we are parts of that whole. So we're just a piece of this larger consciousness system that's been partitioned off and given its own free will to make choices. So we're a part of the system and, you know, aware and talking about place, that's a concept that is meaningful to this virtual reality that we're in. But within consciousness, the, you know, the word where really doesn't have any meaning. Physical matter realities are, you said that consciousness is the computer. Is that correct? In physical, in our reality. No, no, well, just in general, uh, consciousness is the computer that decodes the physical matter reality. Right. Consciousness is the computer that serves up this virtual reality. And we individuated units of consciousness are the players that log on to the, to the avatars, to the virtual avatars in the virtual reality. But the computer is the larger consciousness system. And a piece of that larger consciousness system configures itself as a, cur as a server as a computer and other pieces of that larger consciousness system are configured as us, the players, the individuated units of consciousness. So okay. it's all so, part of the consciousness okay. system, the computer, the players, and the, the operating system are all just different subsets of the, of the uh, entire, uh, you know, larger system. So are, if the LCS if consciousness is, is computer is a computer, are we also, are, as consciousness, kind of like computers as well in that sense or no? No, not really. It's just that consciousness takes a part, you know, consciousness is an information system. So if you have an information system, then you can create that to emulate a computer. You know, we can emulate computers inside of computers. We have information systems that uh, emulate other computers, like for a long time, in order to gain some compatibility between Mac and PCs, the Macs had a PC emulator inside the Mac so that you could run your Mac like it was a PC. So that's a computer being emulated inside a computer. Well, this, this information system called the larger conscious system, it can configure a piece of itself to be that computer. In other words, to emulate a, a computer, a server. So it just does that. It's just a number cruncher. It's a thing that, that uh, uh, serves up a virtual reality, like any computer might serve up a virtual reality. It has a rule set, serves up the virtual reality. So the LCS itself, um, meaning like the, the mind of the LCS, so to speak, is not technically like a com it's not technically like a computer like we think of a computer, but it can configure parts of itself to act like a computer. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's more, it's more like us. See, or we're more like it. It's consciousness. It's awareness. And it is digital information because awareness is all about information. You know, what you're aware of is information. But it's an awareness like we are, except it doesn't have all the fear and all the baggage and things that we have. And it has a bigger picture than we have. But it can configure part of itself to serve as a server just to do the math and serve up a virtual reality. You said that the LCS is actually billions of years ahead of us evolutionary wise in, the growth, in, its, in its growth process. I think you said that one time. Uh, well, in its growth process. That's really hard to say because it's been around a very long time. Yes, it's been around longer than this universe has been around because this universe was created as a simulation. Yes. You see, so 
in our years marked by our time, then it's been around longer than the universe because the universe is a product of itself. On the other hand, it has been evolving all along. It's still evolving. It's not done. It's still trying to figure things out and optimize its processes and, and that sort of thing. And that goes back, you know, some of its major evolution only goes back maybe, um, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand years. So it, it's, it's learned a lot from this simulation, just like, um, just like we're learning a lot from it. The system itself learned a lot once it created this, this simulation. And the reason I say that is that, that um, it had to learn that love is the answer. It had to learn that the optimal way to organize uh, a social system is with caring and compassion and cooperation. It didn't just come knowing that. It had to figure that out. And until it had us logged on to this virtual reality, it also didn't have an environment that caused it a lot of stress or a lot of choices or a lot of moral choices. It also was in this kind of sterile space where there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of consequences for what it did. Now it had a higher level of consequences as the system that we had individually, but still it was limited. So when it started this virtual reality, the, the larger conscious system also had a very uh, sterile environment where it had system choices and it could see uh, from the system viewpoint, but it didn't have the, the, the high consequence choices that you know, we have in this virtual reality. So after it created the virtual reality and after IUOCs populated it as the players of the characters in the virtual reality, it also got a lot of education. It also had a lot to learn. So a lot of its evolution as, uh, you know, the kind of the leader, the, the, the uh, kind of the, the system in this, in this system of, in, of individuated pieces has happened since that simulator went up, which means, you know, in the last couple of hundred thousand years for us as humans anyway, it's, it's happened now. This simulator, our, our Earth, our solar system, has been around for, you know, a few billion years. It's, you know, our, our um, universe is, what, five billion years old or some sort of thing like that. 13.7 or something like that. Is it that many? Yeah. Billion years? 13, um, when I looked, it was around 13.5, something like that, billion years. Okay. Well, maybe our part in it... Uh, has been, you know, we're not in the youngest part of the universe. We're in a middle-aged part of the universe. There's other parts that are much younger. So maybe our part of the universe is maybe about 5 billion years old. Um, okay. That number five is sticking in my head someplace. And in any case, uh, at that time, uh, it had to let us be, to have, have an understanding that the best way for these individuated unit of consciousness to work with the avatars and to interact with each other in this virtual reality was that it just had to leave us alone and let us figure it out on our own and not try to get us to do it right. You know, you have this tendency. We have a tendency when we know, oh, this is a better way to do it. And we just want to go tell people how it is they ought to do it. And we know that doesn't work well. People have to figure it out and do it themselves. Otherwise they don't grow from it. Mm -hmm. If they just do it because that's what they were told to do, then that's not growing for them. Growing for them is to figure out, oh, this is a better way. I need to do it this way. And now they grow up. So the system had to learn that itself. And in that case, we were its teacher. We were, uh, you know, giving it uh, uh, feedback and, and uh, problems. It, we were not very obedient and we were not doing what it planned for us to do. We were going to come here and make all these great uh, love-based decisions and grow up very quickly. And instead we didn't, we, uh, you know, found a lot of fear. We found a lot of uh, dysfunction and we've been working on that ever since. Well, that was really to be expected because in that big chat room, we had a lot of potential for, for positive and for negative. It was just potential though. We hadn't actually, you know, 
worked out much of that potential. It was just sitting there as potential. So once we got here and had all these high uh, quality choices to make, well, we found out there were a lot of low quality choices here as well. And our potential spread out into all the choices. So we ended up uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, self-centered, fearful things. And that's because we didn't know any better. We'd never actually learned. We'd always been in the sterile situation. So you have to start at the bottom and work your way up. You can't start at the middle or at the end. You have to start at the beginning. And at the beginning, you have kind of a low quality of consciousness and have to build from there. So the system learned with us. Were all the IUOCs created at the same time or were some created and then as time went on, others were created as well? I think, well, in, in general, now there are all others are being created all the time. As our population, just on this, in this planet, as our population grows, you need new IUOCs. So the IUOCs that are needed are created. And the way that it would do that is it would take a kind of an average, a typical IUOC that was here, you know, at kind of the level that it is. And I'd say you'd take a, a copy here. Here's a, here's that subset that partitioned off piece of the larger consciousness system. That's an IUOC. Okay. Let's take that and uh, copy and paste, 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 paste. Now we have four more IUOCs that are just kind of average. So let them then start playing new avatars. So that's kind of the way it is. So the, the, new, the new IUOCs come in at kind of the average level so that they can get into the play. They're not terribly far behind. They're not ahead. They're just kind of like everybody else. So the new IUOCs, um, they are, they're like consciousness that never existed before. So it's, they never had like lifetimes before. They're just brand new, like consciousness, individual units of consciousness that the LCS create. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'd say they are new individuated units of consciousness that have never had lifetimes before. Yeah. So it's the LCS. New consciousness because, you know, it's all part of the larger conscious system. So all the consciousness is, is, is uh, part of this larger conscious system. So it's not new in that sense, but it's a new individuated chunk. It's a new uh, subset that has never had experiences in this reality, in this virtual reality that we call the universe before. Just um, a quick thought. Let's suppose that there was a catastrophe and maybe half the population or three quarters of the population was wiped out. What would all those IUOCs do if they couldn't come here? Are there other PMRs for them to go to? Yes. There are other PMRs for them to go to, or uh, they could, you know, if, you know, we're just talking about possibilities now. So we're kind of looking at all the, you know, the possible things. Yes, there are other PMRs. That's a physical matter reality for those out there that PMR doesn't mean anything to those. Uh, it's, a, it's a virtual reality that, that feels very physical mm -hmm. as opposed to a virtual reality that doesn't have such a tight rule set. And, you know, it, it has a lot, uh, uh, but a lot fewer constraints on it. Therefore, it doesn't have as, as actions aren't as tightly tied together. But yes, there's multiples of those. But another thing it could do is just take those and, and uh, not play them. Let them sit out a while until they're needed. Now, what would happen if we did that? Well, no time would pass for them. Hmm. You see, no time would pass for them. So it's not like they'd be sitting around twiddling their thumbs, getting bored and saying, oh, what do I do now? They wouldn't have, they just would not log them on to a virtual reality. So they just, they could just stay as potential. Um, you know, what happens, what happens to, uh, uh, well, maybe it's not a good analog. I was going to say, you know, there are potential characters that you could play. You know, you're, you're a, you're a player. You play virtual reality games. Okay. You can play a character for a while. And then let's say you decide you want a different character. So in your world of Warcraft, so you make up a different character. So now you also run a barbarian as well as an elf, as well as something else. And you maybe have several characters, but you can only play one at a time. What are those other characters doing when you're not playing them? 
they're not playing. They're, they're there. Like the, the concept is there of the character within the computer, but they're just not active. They're not being played. They're not, right. they're not active. Right. So it would be that kind of thing. So if we have, if we didn't have so many seats, okay. And you had all these IUOCs and if these IUOCs didn't have say a virtual reality to log on to, mm -hmm. then they could always go back to the chat room. You mentioned and the wait. chat room. I'm, is the chat room kind of like the afterlife? Instead? No, it's not really an afterlife. It's just a place where all IUOCs can interact with each other. But uh, what, what does it look like? Does it look like a physical world or is it just kind of, I, I can't picture in my mind what it's like. Okay. It does not look like a physical world. And in your mind, the reason you can't picture it is there aren't any pictures. It's uh, consciousness communicates. It's what it does. It, it shares information. It's an information sharing thing and it doesn't take up space. It's not in a particular place. It's in consciousness. Okay. Now virtual reality has space. We have three space when we make that with a three mutually orthogonal unit vectors. Okay. You know, an X, a Y and a Z and that creates in us virtual reality, a three space, but within consciousness itself, there is no space. So they're just all of these awarenesses that exist in consciousness. And the only, the only virtual reality that they can log on to is basically this chat room. And there, the only rules are the rules that are the communication protocols. They know how to send messages and receive messages, just like being in a chat room. When you're in a chat room, you don't necessarily have visuals. You don't necessarily have a room with furniture that you sit in and whatever. It's just a whole bunch of people who are all uh, communicating with each other. Now our chat rooms, that may look like, uh, you know, uh, typing goes by. We may see, you know, lines of letters and paragraphs and things go by how we communicate. But with consciousness to consciousness, every consciousness is netted to all the other consciousness, all consciousness on a net. So you communicate by intention, not by typing on a keyboard. So you have all these consciousnesses and they can communicate with each other and, and open up links, close links down to whomever they like. Be in a shared space where a lot of links are open to a, to a shared, no, I say space, but this is a communication space, not a physical space. So there's really no picture. It's not like an afterlife. It's just consciousness, telepathically interacting with other consciousness. Okay. Um, that brings up like 10 questions, but I'll go to this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you, are you familiar with um, like the work of Dr. Michael Newton or Dolores Cannon? And Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. I had a, a reader of mine. Uh, actually it was Ted, the guy who ran my, uh, uh, what is it? The forum for quite a while. Uh, he's passed on now, but uh he was a, he had read uh, Michael Newton's books and he wanted me to read them very badly because he wanted me to ask me questions about him. So I did read Newton's book and in general, he got in very general terms, he's, he got it right. Mm. Okay. That's just about the way it works. It was very, um, very close, but from another viewpoint, it was, it was very generalized. And the way I describe it is, let's imagine that, that there's a bunch of uh, five or six year olds that you know, that all went to Disneyland together. So you've got a whole group, you know, so you got 20 of these six year olds and you're sitting around asking them, well, what was Disneyland like? Now this is an analog to Newton asking all these people he's regressed with hypnosis, what's the afterlife like? Okay, and you're asking these children now, what's the, what was Disneyland like? And the children are telling you, oh, I met this big mouse. He was so big. He was like eight feet tall. And, you know, I met Goofy and I met all these things. And, and you can say, well, was that, was that really Mickey Mouse? And, oh, yeah, that was really Mickey Mouse. And I met him too. You see, you would have that kind of thing. So they're reporting what they saw. And they're reporting it accurately. That five-year-old did see a big giant Mickey Mouse, and he's not making it up. It's not a lie. It's the truth. It's what he saw, but they don't necessarily understand that there's a bigger picture, that that was a man in a mouse suit, and that there's probably 10 of those walking around in Disneyland at any one time, and et cetera. 
And it's not at all the same as a cartoon that he's seen of Mickey Mouse. That, you know, so that's a, that's a whole different perspective when you see kind of the back picture. But you, with Newton, and he's talking to this people, he's getting the, here's what, I, here's what I experienced. And what he got was pretty accurate. That is what they experienced. But he didn't get much of the back picture of what actually was going on and what that experience meant and why people had different experiences and that sort of thing. If you understood it from a bigger perspective, you would agree that he got a lot of correct information from the people that he was regressing, but that didn't necessarily tell the whole story, that there's a lot more to it than, than just that. So mostly he got it right. And the way he says it works, it pretty much works that way from the perspective of most people who go through it. So when we physically die here on earth in this bodies, our consciousness will go to another PMR? Yes. It'll go to not another PMR, it'll go to another virtual reality. Now I call PMR, physical matter reality, as a virtual reality that has a very tight rule set which makes it physical. Now, physical means that there's, everything's interactive, okay? It's all interactive, it's a, it's a multiplayer game. It's a very interactive game. Now, when you dream, that's another virtual reality, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have that tight rule set. The things that you do in a dream don't necessarily affect anybody else. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have that same physical sense to it, even if it appears physical when we're in the dream. It's, it's, it's different. And you can go to a space like an out-of-body space. And that's even less coherent than a dream often. Uh, not always, but often. It can be uh, uh, more, more dreamlike than dreamlike. Mm -hmm. So in any case, that's, that's even a more generalized rule set, not so specific. So yes, after you die here, after your avatar dies here, again, you don't, you're not the avatar, you know. After you, after your avatar dies here, you as a piece of conscious become aware that you are now in a different virtual reality, but it's not a PMR. It's not a physical kind. It's got a very loose rule set, more like a dream reality. I guess I just wanted to kind of know a little bit more about what that virtual reality is like, because, you know, Dr. Michael Newton's clients um, explained it in the book and he said like, the client said that you go, go back to your soul group, you know, you, you meet with um, the council of elders to decide your next lifetime. You have a guardian angel, things like that. You see relatives and I understand every, everything that you said about the uncle Fred, but um, I'm kind of wondering, is, is any of that true? Are there really a council of elders and you, you know, spirit guides and things like that and you go back to your soul group or or they just no mostly that is just not the way it is that's not the general experience that uh oh people can interpret things like that out of their experience but that's the difference between thinking you see mickey mouse and thinking you know and actually you're seeing a man dressed up in a mouse suit <laughs> it's all in how you interpret what you see okay so the, what they do is after you leave after you uh, kind of wake up in this other virtual reality, you do that immediately upon the death of your, your avatar. So in the beginning, you don't really know where you are or what's going on. And you're kind of, uh, what you're, you're beginning to forget the, your, your last life experience that you just finished. That starts to fade like a dream and you're looking around and going, you know, where is this? Where, what, am I going, what am I doing? And almost immediately somebody will say, over here, uh, you know, this way, you're fine, you're all right, come on. And the whole idea is to get people to relax and to let go. So that's the process. Now, if you, whatever it takes, I guess, to help you relax, let go, and get ready to go back into another experience packet, uh, that's what you'll get. In other words, it's a, it's a kind of a custom fit for you. So some people who have been around this track enough times, they don't have a lot of that process. They go, yeah, yeah, I know. And they go, you know, they kind of shortcut all the process and go right to the end. And they start negotiating immediately for what it is they want to do next. Others who ha don't have that much experience with it, 
they have a lot more process. And the process depends a lot on what it takes to communicate with them. Okay, if they come with a lot of beliefs, then you have to give them something that kind of ties into their beliefs. Otherwise, they will be very, uh, oh, I don't know, frightened because people are frightened when they're in situations that, that, that they don't know about. So if you come in and you're very religious and you expect to find St. Peter at a gate looking through a big book to see if your name's on it, well, that may be what you see. You may see some sort of that, that kind of a process because anything else would frighten you. So if you, if you don't come in with those kind of beliefs, then the way it typically is, is you get invited to come, you get nice voices, everybody sounds happy, and you go there. Sometimes you'll, you'll meet uh, relatives or people you know who've, who have died because that, and they'll tell you, everything's great here, you're really gonna like it. All of this is just manufactured for you to set you at ease and make you feel comfortable so you can let go and uh, begin the process of thinking about what you're going to do next, your next experience packet. So that's the idea. We don't want people to get caught up in fear or to have a lot of anxiety over it. So if you're expecting a council of elders, particularly let's say you are, uh, you've grown up in a, in a, um, a culture where Elders are the ones that order everything. Like maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe American Indians uh, in the 1700s or 1600s, where the Council of Elders was the people who made the final decisions. They were the top end of the, of the management chain. Well, that's maybe what you'd have to find then. You'd have to find a Council of Elders who would tell you what it is you did next. That would be the appropriate vision for you to have. So these things, can happen, but it doesn't mean that that's, you know, that that's the fact, that that's the way it is, that when you get there, first thing you have to do is check in with the Council of Elders, because people who don't have that need to be, to be presented with a Council of Elders, well, they never see a Council of Elders. That's not the way they do it. For most people in our culture today, basically, it's just a kind of a, a stalling process where people mill around, stand in lines, you know, wait, uh, wait for in-processing just as a stalling tactic to let them let go, relax, find themselves now entirely out of the other space, entirely in this space. Meanwhile, that, that, uh, that partition between the individuated unit of consciousness and the free will awareness unit that's actually logged on to the, to the character that's disintegrating, that's coming apart. So now after that person's kind of let go and relaxed, now it's the individuated unit of consciousness again. It's not the free will awareness unit anymore. It's kind of made that transition from one to the other, that partition's taken down, and now it's, the, it's thinking as that free will awareness unit. So how, how does that merging I mean, together? I said that wrong, it's not the free will awareness unit, it's, it's acting as that individuated unit of consciousness. Right, you said the partition, so after death, once we kind of reintegrate into the other virtual reality, which some people call the afterworld, afterlife. Yeah. The partition between the, the avatar and the individual of consciousness begins to drop. And then how does that integration process happen with the free will awareness unit into the IUOC again? Is that just, is, is there a process for that or is there an amount of time or is it just, it just it happens as, as you say, as, well, let me first, this is the first mention of a free will awareness unit. So let me give your listeners a little help here. Sure. Okay, we have the, the individuated unit of consciousness that we've talked about. It's just a piece of the larger conscious system. Well, that takes a part of itself. Remember, it's been a partitioned part of the larger conscious system. Now it's just a piece like the larger, like the larger conscious system is a piece of consciousness and it can do the same things basically the LCS can do because it's a piece of consciousness. So it partitions off a piece of itself that it actually then logs on to make the choices for the avatar. The avatar is just a virtual character in a virtual reality. And this free will awareness unit is the player that's making its choices. So this free will awareness unit is just a piece of this individuated unit of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's kind of the way it goes. 
So now when the avatar, when the avatar dies, this free will awareness unit no longer is logged on to that avatar. So this free will awareness unit without having some, that's, that's its whole function is to log on to an avatar. Well, it's not logged on to that avatar anymore because that avatar died. So what happens is it just reintegrates with that individuated unit of consciousness. So you can say that petition comes down, but it doesn't happen like in a millisecond, wham, because anything in consciousness that happens suddenly tends to make people frightened. Sudden things happening and sudden changes in your consciousness make people, what's wrong? You know, what's the problem? We, it, it creates anxiety. So the transition happens gently enough and slowly enough that you don't really notice it, which is why you need this little, um, uh, I call it the transition virtual reality. So you can make that transition so the free will awareness unit disappears and now you're just a, a part of the individuated unit of consciousness ready to decide on what kind of uh, experience packets you want next. Okay, your next incarnation, if you like to use those words. So you decide on that and then when you do decide on that, again, you make a petition of yourself, another free will awareness unit, and then that plays the new avatar that you log on to. And so on it goes. Are there any other beings or I guess other individuated units of consciousness that help us decide what other incarnation we want to take on? Or is this all just a decision we make entirely on our own, kind of like in a bubble? No, we don't make it uh, ourselves. Uh, we, we have input to it. We say, yes, we're ready. No, we're not. We say, uh, yes, I'd like to work on anger management this time because that gave me a lot of problem last time. We agree with that. Uh, you know, and if we don't agree with that, we, we may uh, say, no, I don't want to work on that. I want to do something else. Or we could say, well, the only thing that happened, the only reason I made such bad choices was because I was so poor and uneducated and had such a rough life. Otherwise, I would have done brilliantly. Well, in that case, then uh, you don't want to be poor and uneducated in, or born into a, a situation where that's likely to happen. And you may say, no, I don't want that. You know, I had that, didn't do well with it. So next time I want something else. And your free will will always win out. You have free will and the system will not overrun your free will. So you have those kinds of inputs to it. Or you might say, well, I really did well uh, in relation to you know, to Susie Q. Susie Q and I really had a good relationship and we brought out the best in each other. Could I, uh, you know, do something with Susie Q again? Well, that could be arranged as well. So all of this is the kind of stuff that goes on. But when it gets right down to picking an avatar for you to log on to, you have no idea what avatars are available, what their, you know, what their DNA is, what their, you know, what their situation is. That's a database that the system has that's running this virtual reality, it has all of that, you don't. So you agree on the general things that you'd like, things that you don't like, things that you want to learn, and then the system picks out something for you that looks like it suits. And it'll tell you something about it if you ask, well, what are the parameters here? And it'll tell you, well, da, 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 you know, this race, this place, this whatever, whatever. And if you say no, then it'll have to pick something else out. But almost nobody says no because you don't know enough to say no. And you know that the system is there trying to help you succeed because as you succeed, it succeeds. It only has, you know, it's, it has, you know, it, it's, uh, what can we say? It's the evolution is dependent in part in your evolution because you're a piece of it. So it doesn't want you to fail. So it's going to try to put you in a place where it calculates the probabilities that you'll have a good chance of succeeding or as good a chance as, as, uh, as it would any, any place else. So we generally rely on the system to pick something after we kind of define what it is we want. I have a few questions. Um, I guess one is you said that the memories of our lifetime quickly fade once we go off into the virtual reality. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were traumatized, if we, if we led a very difficult life and we were traumatized, 
does, do those memories kind of disappear from the IUOC or are they always retained in, or every memory is just retained in the IUOC? Well, all the memories that we had are all retained in a database. Okay, so they're all kept. All of our experiences, all the choices we made, all of that is kept in a database. The awareness um, of being in that, of being that character in that thing. Let's say it was a traumatic thing. Let's say you got, you know, you were walking in the park and a bunch of guys grabbed hold of you, beat you up and, and robbed you and killed you but they hurt you a lot first, but it was a real traumatic kind of thing going on because you know, you had a new wife and a couple of babies and this kind of thing. You had a lot going on and a lot of people depended on you. So the whole thing is traumatic. You're not ready to die. And it was a, a horrible, painful way to go. What happens is that you, you begin very quickly to forget that just like you forget dreams, even very dramatic dreams, you know, you begin to forget them even if they're really horrible or awful dreams, a couple of days go by and they kind of get foggier and foggier and, and you forget them with, with time. Well, that's the way this is. So you just begin to, to disconnect from that and let it go, just like it was a dream. So you no longer are emotionally invested in that character after you let it go. Just like when you are in that, that nightmare, that dream, you were emotionally invested in that character, what happened to that character, what that character did. But as soon as you wake up, that emotional investment isn't there anymore. Now you're invested in this person who's awake, sitting up in bed, rubbing their eyes. And that other character just starts to fade because you're no longer attached to that other character and it fades and goes away. And that's sort of what happens. So though the information is collected, you, you know, the free will awareness unit is not, you know, is returned to the, to the uh, uh, individuated unit of consciousness and the emotional investment in that situation disappears. Okay. Why, wh how would you explain sometimes that people come into a lifetime with uh, maybe certain traumas or they still have some semblance of fear from past lifetimes or is, is that not? Is that nonsense? Well, no, there's a couple of ways that that can happen. One, if you have a lot of fear, okay, if you have a lot of fear at, the, at your being level, okay, now the fact that you get mugged and beat up, that's just an experience. And it's not your, if it's not your dominant life experience, then that's not going to stick as part of giving you a lot of fear at the being level. But if you've lived a life of getting, gotten beat up every, every day, you know, you, 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 get, uh, you get mauled every day of your life for the last 50 years, now that will change you at a deep level. That'll be part of your being level. And when you, next time you come back, you'll have that, that kind of fear will be with you because that's part of who you are. That's, that's part of what you, you learned. But just getting run over by a truck or, or whatever, having an ugly ending or, a, or a, a violent ending, that doesn't really leave a big scar because it, it does, it's not really representative of your life or your experience. It's just a, a thing that happened and is over. And uh, you don't even have to deal with the consequences of it because you're dead now. So that, that doesn't stick. So why do some people come back with, uh, you know, with, issues of some sort. Well, a couple of reasons. It may be that if you have repeated similar kinds of things over and over again, that it's a part of your being level. It's who you are. Now that is a part of your consciousness and your next incarnation, you're going to have to deal with that. Now you won't have to deal with the same situation, new incarnation, new avatar, new situation, but you'll have to deal with that level of fear perhaps. You may have to deal with the fact that you were uh, abandoned and that kind of thing. So you may find trust difficult. Okay? That may be a thing for you. To, you find trusting people a very difficult thing to do. So you'll just have to deal with that and uh, gr outgrow it. You know, that's the way that happens. So that's one reason you might come in that way. Another reason that you might come in with a uh, very particular talent or a particular problem 
is that it creates a situation for you to deal with that is something you need to deal with. Or it creates a situation for you to be helpful to other people. You know, I mean, we have, um, you know, children sometimes come in at the age of three, they start playing the piano and by the time they're five, you know, they're good enough to play in concerts. You know, well, Mozart, Beethoven are a couple of examples of that. You know, people who have gone on then to, to uh, be real influential, real powerhouses in, in producing music. Well, you know, that's unusual. Well, they probably came in with that as something they wanted to do, needed to do. That, uh, you know, that may have been a mission. Maybe developing that part of the culture at that time was a thing that needed to be done and, and they were a part of it. So sometimes people come in with a, with a skill or, a, or even a problem because that will give them then an opportunity to deal with it in, in a different situation where they might be more successful with it. It will be different than the old lifetime in that old situation. So that'd be one reason. Another reason would be if the system wanted to give you that for some reason, like, you know, a Beethoven or, or a Mozart. Um, another reason is that the system might want you to help other people grow up. So it may give you very, very specific and detailed memories of something that happened in a past life. And you're able to remember all the details about it and people can go check the history and you're only six or seven years old and you're telling uh, people about how you were shot down in World War II and you had this kind of airplane or World War I and you had that kind and you got shot down over a particular place and this was your name and this was your serial number, you know, and, and all that. And you're only six years old and they go look all that stuff up, which isn't easy to do. Certainly a six-year-old doesn't look it up and come up with a scam, you know, that just knows that. And you find out all that work. There was a guy by that name. There wasn't an airplane, you know, of that type that did get shot down over that place. And now that's verification that, you know, this boy has the memories of that other lifetime. So that's, that is kind of engineered by the system just because that helps a lot of other people see bigger pictures. I guess I have a question uh, in regard to past lives. You, you mentioned that it's possible that the young boy can remember his past life. Question, my question is, is it possible that we can develop our awareness to a point where we can actually remember our past lives or is that beyond the average person to do? Well, it's not so much remembering them in the way that we usually think of remembering. You know, we remember experiences. Um, it's usually in the way of getting the data out of the database. So we can go we can go to that database. I said all the things that all the choices you made, all the things you've seen and done, thought about, uh, you know, wanted to, wanted to do but didn't. It's not only the things you did, but it's all the things you thought about as well. Feelings, all of that's available in the database, and you can go back to that database and kind of see that. And you can do it in several ways. You can do it like looking at a movie. You know, it's like you're looking at it. You can get it in terms of words or descriptions, like somebody's telling you about it. Or you can actually go get into that movie to where now you're a character in the movie. You can kind of relive it. Okay. And as you do that, you know, it becomes part of your experience again because you're, you're thinking about it. So... So it's not really the same as remembering uh, last, you know, Christmas when you went to grandma's house. You know, it's not quite bringing up something out of your memory that way, but it is getting the data and reliving it, if you like, or re-experiencing it, which then it does become a part of your experience if you re-experience it that way. But it's just information. So yes, there are ways that you can do that. But on the other hand, there's not really a lot of reason, good reasons to do that other than curiosity. You know, if you have some curiosity, occasionally you'll find something there that's significant, but mostly looking at your past lives, uh, unless you're looking at them for very specific things to help you grow up, you know, very specific problems like, 
where did this issue come from? I, I just I can't relate. I know I have this issue, but I can't relate to having it. Maybe it came from a past life and you can maybe find that might be useful to you. But in general, people just want to see, I wonder what I did before. I wonder who I was before. And I put that under the heading of inquiring egos want to know. And it's, it's not generally worth your time or what to do that. It's just entertainment value. Hmm. But you can actually find some significant things out by looking at past lives. If you're looking for particularly errors made, you know, the poor decisions made. So you could see, oh, I, can't, I see where I went wrong there. Okay, I want to make sure I don't do that again. You know, those kinds of things, you can get some value uh, learning from it. Do you, have you ever tried to remember your past lives or do you know of them? Yeah, I have, uh, I have gotten in a few of them. Uh, I had some reason to get into the last, say, the last two or three before I ended up with this one, just because the last two or three, I have been preparing, if you will, or practicing for this one. So I can see a progression that I was doing certain sorts of things that help prepare me experience wise for what I'm doing now in this life. So I'd say the last two incarnations back from this one, as, as I look back at them, you know, from hindsight, I can see they were designed as preparatory. Were you like a, a monk or a spiritual adept in those lifetimes to prepare you? Is that um, well, one of them I was, uh, yeah, of something like that, and another one I was looking at it from the opposite side. I was, um, you know, the first one I was somebody from the east in a in a a, a spiritual person's role, and the other one I was somebody from the west interacting with somebody from the east wow. in a spiritual role. But both times I was teaching, both times I was helping, both times I was dealing with people who didn't understand and having to explain and so on. So, yeah, so for the last two, at least, I've been in the process of, of uh, getting ready or getting more prepared, getting more competent uh, for this one. So that was just interesting to me, you know, that, uh, you know, so I found that interesting. So that was some of the acquiring egos want to know. There wasn't a lot of benefit in that. So I don't put much time into it, but uh, curiosity isn't a bad thing. You just don't want to pour a whole lot of effort into curiosity. You realize it is kind of entertainment and not really germane to your, to your growth most of the time. So if you dabble with that, that's fine. It's not like don't do that. It's just curiosity. Curiosity's all right, but don't get too wrapped up in it. Don't make it uh, something that's real important when it's not. And, and like you said in one of your interviews that when you're being interviewed or sometimes when you're just talking to people, you're like half in this world and half somewhere else, like maybe another virtual reality. Is yeah. You said that? Okay. Could you could you basically expound on that? Like what? Well, sure. As you as you um, as you grow, as you evolve and get rid of your fear, um, your reality gets bigger. Fear actually just narrows your reality down. Matter of fact, we can see the the uh, uh, you know the the place where if you get more and more fear, you end up depressed. A depressed person is somebody who has so much fear their reality is only that big. You know, it's like they have these blinders on and they can only see this horrible situation. That's it. There may be lots of other good things that could be in their life for people that love them, you know, things to do, whatever, but they can't see any of that. The only thing that they see in their reality is this horrible situation. So their, their, their choices now get down to put up with this horrible situation or die you know, commit suicide. That seems like the only two choices they have, live a horrible life or die. And in fact, they have a lot more choices than that. There's a lot of other places they could go. There's lots of positive things that they could plug into, but they don't see it. So as you grow up, you just expand that and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now here's how big it is when you're normal. And, but then you keep on growing and getting rid of fear and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So what happens is you start living 
in a larger reality. And you're not just living in this physical reality anymore. You mm -hmm. are cognizant, you're aware in both this reality and in a reality where these databases are, let's say, where you have lots of other information. So you're talking to somebody and at the same time you're having a conversation with them, you, they're telling you about how their poor sick mother uh, just broke her hip. Well, while they're talking to you about it, you're visiting the mom, you're seeing the condition, how bad is the hip, what's the prognosis, uh, you know, what most does she need, and you're starting to work healing on her at the same time you're having this conversation with this person. So now you're working really at two different levels, two different realities and two different levels at the same time. Not that hard a thing to do. It's just, you know, it seems like, wow, that's really bizarre and out there. But when you live in a bigger reality, it's not, it's just normal. It's just what's available to you. And it doesn't happen to you overnight. So it's not like it's a big change. It happens to you very gradually as you grow up. So yes, when somebody asks me a question, I'd like to answer not only the question they ask, but the real question behind the one that they ask. Because often people are asking me in a public forum, you know, like on a fireside chat or in something, and they may not really want to go into any details that are too personal. So they try to skirt around the question in such a way to ask it that they'll get the answer they need, but without really saying too much about themselves or why they're really asking the question. It's helpful for me to understand why they're really asking the question so I can give them an answer that meets their needs rather than just give them the answer of the question they ask. So I'm constantly doing that in, in groups where I'm talking and so on. I try to, and not only that, I'll be aware of what the other people who are there, what they are going to make of the answer and the things that they may need to know that are very similar. So I may answer actually the questions of five or six people that I know have similar issues while I'm trying to answer that one. So I'll get a little far off of that one. And that's why my answers tend to be real long because I'm really answering a lot of questions, um, you know, at the same time. And I have to hit different aspects of it to cover everybody's because people in the audience are thinking questions. Oh, Oh, well, then what about this? Oh, well, what about that? So then I like to answer those two as part of the original answer. So I like to answer the unasked questions as well. And I also have to think about once this goes on YouTube and there's going to be 100,000 people look at it, how much harm could it do? Am I going to say things in answering this question that will be misunderstood and cause trouble, cause difficulty? So I have to be aware of that as well. So you don't like help 10 people out and then damage, you know, a thousand people because it was more information than they could process and, it, and it, they misunderstood it and came to some negative conclusion. So I try to take all that into consideration and come out with something that does the best possible match with all of that information. And I do that as I talk. Can you just look at a person and like me, for instance, maybe we've been talking now for a little bit over an hour. And can you know something about me like on a psychic level, like maybe look into me and see my persona, my past lives or what I'm about. Can you do that with people or? Yes, you do that with people. And it's not so much that you look into them like you've got, you know, there they are. And, and that, this is the book of Chad Walker. So I've got his book and I'm kind of thumbing through it and seeing what he's all about. It's not like that, but just as we interact, just the things that I need to know to respond more profitably for you to the questions you ask, that's what I get. So I'm not really looking at anything else. You know, I'm not looking at your private life. I'm not looking at, uh, you know, your wife and children or girlfriend or mother or brothers and sisters or, because that's not pertinent to what we're doing here. So I'm just looking at that part of Chad that is asking this question. I'm also trying to get through you what you're trying to give to your audience because the questions you ask aren't just because you want to know the answer. You're trying to ask questions that will help your audience understand this better. 
So I can see the difference between those. So then I need a more general answer for your audience rather than a personal answer for you. So it's, yeah, put all that together as we go. But it's not me, you know, sometimes in the early, in the very early stages of, of growing into a bigger reality, it's like you're parallel processing multiple realities. Like, okay, I'm talking to, to Susie about her poor mother. So while I'm doing that, I'm spending a little time listening to Susie, but I'm also going over and working on the mom. And I'm just kind of jumping back and forth uh, fast enough that I'm able to do both of them at the same time. But later, that's just in the beginning, but later it's not like that. It's just, everything is just there as you need it. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to bring up a picture of, of mom's health body and see where the stuff, you know, everything as you need it is there and you just use it. So it makes it simple. You don't have to ask, you don't have to go into a meditation state. You don't have to do anything. I'm not really working any processes. I'm just interacting with the whole as it comes to me and sending it back out. It's just that I'm operating in a reality that's bigger than just the physical. I see. And, you know, most of us do that to some extent. You know, we pick up vibes and we pick up things from people. You know, I call it vibes, a little new age talk there. You know, you, you get a sense of a person that you're talking to. And some people you just really like and other people you just really don't. And it's because of an exchange of data that is larger than just this physical world. So it's not like I'm an unusual person that does this. I do it probably to an unusual extent. But everybody, you know, interacts in multiple reality frames all the time. We are multidimensional beings. We're consciousness. And we interact in a, in a lot of multidimensional ways. And it's just natural to us. We don't think about it. It just is there. Well, it's the same way with me, except it's maybe a, a little more so that way that, uh, that I do, because I've been working on this now for the last 40 years. So, you know, you, you gain with experience and you gain with, with growth. So anything you do for 40 years, you ought to be reasonably good at it <laughs> if you've been practicing it that long. So that's kind of the way it is. So it's just a larger reality that has more information in it. So you have a larger set of choices where and a larger set of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. where, where does karma play into all this? Is karma real? Do, or, do we experience karma in the same lifetime or can it go over, over many lifetimes? What are your thoughts on karma? Okay, karma is often misunderstood and is, it's often... Um, made to be something very specific. Oh, I murdered this guy in this lifetime, now he's gonna murder me in the next, or somebody will murder me in the next to make up for it. It's not that kind of a specific thing. Karma is basically the idea that there, are, there is no free lunch, there are no free passes. You get to work on an issue that you have, something you're trying to learn until you get it. So if you get it wrong, you get to work on it again. If you get it wrong, you get to work on it again. So it's not that by doing things in a very, let's say a negative way where you make poor choices, that now you have uh, you know, some kind of a punishment for the poor choice. You have, to, you have to experience somebody else doing a poor choice with you or it's not that way. Karma is basically the idea that you get to repeat and try and try again until you get it. So you don't get to move on to the next thing until you've done, you know, the last thing. So that's all karma is. It's not a punishment. It's just that it's not like, well, you've been working long enough. You will just graduate you to the next grade. You know, you'll get a, an E for effort and go on. It's not like that. You may spend a hundred lifetimes or a thousand lifetimes just trying to make the progress that somebody else makes in a half a lifetime just because you're not going to, you know, you, you have to develop that growth in yourself. It's just something you have to do. So it's, it's, that is karma. Karma says, all right, I'm a miserable human being. That means I'm going to have to deal with being a miserable human being again and again and again until I'm not a miserable human being. So you say, oh, that's just bad karma. You know, now I have to deal with all, you know, this misery. Well, 
because you need to deal with all that misery and you need to deal with it because you haven't outgrown it yet. So that's simply all karma is. It isn't, you know, I kicked you in the shin. Now you'll have to kick me in the shin to make it even, you know, that this karma is a, somebody's keeping a scorecard. There's not a scorecard that has to balance in the end. There's just, you either grow up or you don't. And if you don't grow up, then you're still in that same miserable pot of stew that you were in last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of a, kind of a, a different question going back to something we talked about earlier. You said that the IUOC has a little bit of input over to, into what kind of what lifetime they want to lead in the next life. And they usually take the first option. But is it possible that you have an attachment to something in this life that's so strong, whether it be music or a sport or, or as an artist, that you like go, that you want to come back as that in the next lifetime and you ask the LCS, I really want to come back. I, I didn't finish my music. I want to come back as, and the LCS will grant that to you. Or it doesn't work like on an, you know, on an individual egotistical level like that. Yeah, no, it does work on the individual uh, level. It is individual and you always have your free will. And if you really, really want to do something, if you think that's going to help you grow up, then the system will try to work with you because it's good for you. If you think this is really going to help me grow up, then either it will help you grow up, which means it's a good thing to do, or you will learn that it's not helping you grow up and to let go of it. So it's educational either way. But now if you just want to do something because it was fun or because, you know, you want to, you want to, you only drank 3000 beers in the last lifetime and you'd like to go for, you know, 4,000 and set a new record. Well, then the system isn't going to work with you. They're not going to see that that is something that's going to help you grow up. So they'd say, get over it. You know, they, that's not something they do, but if you really are trying to, to evolve the quality of your consciousness, the system will work with you. And if you think that, oh, I just got started on this music thing, I'd really like to work that again, you know, then it may put, leave that, that intention in your mind so that you grow up knowing that music is what you want to do. And kids who have very strong intentions about what it is they they need to do, they probably come here with that already in place, that that's what it is they, they want to do. Now they may find out that, that turned out really good for them, or they may find out that it didn't. But in any case, they'll learn something useful. You said that um, in this, in terms of our simulation, once something happens in the past, it can't be changed. Is that? Yes. The past is done. Yeah. The past isn't still alive, full of people still making free will choices. That's a logical, what do they call it? Uh, uh, Anyway, it's logically impossible. That doesn't make any sense. You can't still be making free will, cho- free will choices in the past. That's what defines the past is the choices that were made. You said that you've gone back to the past and um, I, I know not like in our, <laughs> you've gone in the database itself, you've gone back to the past and you've tried to interact with the same people in different mm-hmm. ways. And you experience generally the same responses and you realize that you weren't really talking to real people, you were talking to a database. Yes. Now, pe- like for people that think that time travel is possible, is, is it possible? Can we actually go into the future? Or if we go back to the past, are we looking at a database? Like what are your thoughts on the possibilities of time travel within our simulation? I know you said we can't go back to the past. Can we go to the future? You can only go to a probable future. Hmm. You can go into a probable future, but that's not necessarily what's going to happen. And that's also in the database. The probable future database is there, and you can explore that just like you can, you know, the past database that would have, say, a a, a past life or something in the past database. And besides that, there's more. There's not only the past that you actually did, in other words, the actual historical path, but There's also all the things you could have done, but didn't do. Mm -hmm. So there's the past where you married Sally rather than Susie. Because what you, who you married was Susie. So now you're married to Susie, but you can go back and explore the probabilities. Had you married Sally instead? 
So now that's a probable past. Never, never actually happened, but the probabilities of how that would have worked out are there. But again, you're just in probability space. If you follow that, you know, the, the what if analysis, what if I'd married, you know, Sally instead of Susie, you can follow that, but you have to realize that the answers that you're going to get are just based on the probabilities that are in the database. Probabilities for Sally, probabilities for Susie, probabilities for you, probabilities for how your choices would have interacted with other choices. And it's just a probable. So it's, it's something that could have happened, but not necessarily what actually would have happened had you made that other choice. You see, it's just a, a set of possibilities that are likely. So that's what you would get. So that we have the probable past, we have the actual past, and we have the probable future. Right. And those exist, well, they all exist within a database. They all exist within a database. Now that database can be queried, uh, just like you would query a database in Google where you'll get print back or, or talk back. Um, but you also can get it like a movie where you're watching a movie and you can get it like a movie where you're a character in the movie. You can have all of those. So it's a really nifty database that you can get into and it has a lot of detail in it. Details that are not consequential may or may not be accurate. The system doesn't save every bit. It looks at the bits and says, here are the bits that seem to, to us will be the most helpful. And it's see, it, you know, it keeps those and the things that are very inconsequential. Like if you look back at, uh, you know, 2020 in April, you know, here at my house, I'm talking to you at 3.32 PM. And the fact that I scratched my head with my right hand instead of my left hand is not necessarily going to be in the database because it's inconsequential. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have a, it's not something that causes something else that causes something else. It's not part of the active, you know, life. It's just a thing that happened and it's irrelevant. So the, the, the system may not do that, but if it's recorded someplace that I often scratch my head while I talk, well, then the system would just kind of randomly have me do that. And it wouldn't matter whether it was right hand or left hand or whatever. It may actually do that, but just because it was filling in something that was known about me and it was making, it doesn't mean that I actually did that because that thing wasn't that important. So it's that. So the data is there and the data is there enough that the, fist, the system can fill in any missing data as far as, you know, the way probability would have it. But you have to always realize that what you see is not necessarily exactly what happened. It's similar to probably, you know, to what happened. So does the LCS know what the future is going to be for us? Or is that all just a probability as well for it? It's all probability because it has to do with our free will choices. But now given that, that doesn't mean it can't make some pretty good guesses. People tend to be pretty reliable you know they tend to be pretty much they do what they do and here you know you and i we've been in these avatars for for you know a lot of years and we're in these avatars we're making all sorts of choices and all of that's recorded so the system can look at that and have a pretty good guess of what this next choice is we're coming to and how we're going to deal with that that choice it can probably is similar to 300 other choices that we made in different contexts and it can look at that and say, well, okay, out of those 300, you know, 280 of them that did this way and, you know, a few of them that did the other way and see how those differences are. And it can guess, well, he's probably going to do this. So the system can make some pretty good guesses about what's going to happen in the future just because we're pretty dependable. We're pretty habitual in the things we do. We tend to get attitudes and we tend to not do things that are too off of our MO, you know, method of operation, um, because that's just the way we are. So good guesses, yes, but exactly, no. And we always have the right to do something dramatic. It's off the, you know, off the, nobody would expect it, you know, because we might suddenly just learn something. Oh, I get it now. And from now on, all our choices are going to be different. 
you see? And so somebody who was going to guess what we, what we were going to do in the next couple of weeks would just be totally wrong because we changed ourselves. We're not the same person anymore. We grew up and now we start a whole new set of, uh, of data describing the new us. So as we change, you know, that changes, but for the most part, we're pretty steady people and we're not that hard to guess if somebody has all the information. How, on average, how many avatars or lives do people, do, does the average earth person um, live or have lived? Like just your, your average decent person like myself, who's not a criminal, who's not a saint, have I, have I been here 50 times, 10 times, 20 times, 1,000 times? I don't know. It's something I have never really looked into. But what I have read from others who have looked into it, it's more like something like, uh, you know, 10,000 times. It's a lot of times. And as you know, we don't tend to learn very much <laughs> when we're here. Growth is a very small um, you know, it's a, it's a very small increment at a time for most of us. We don't take great leaps very often. Typically, we, we work on understanding and work on it and work on it. And then we may get an aha moment where it all comes together and then we, we make a change. But we've worked on it a long time. So if you look at all the time you worked on it and all the time you've been coming up to it and trying to figure it out and uh, so on, we're pretty slow because we're not... You know, if, if, if growing up was a matter of doing, if it was, a, it was a, some sort of a prescription that you could follow or a method that you could follow, well, we'd all grow up very quickly. If it had to do with the intellect, something you could understand, well, we'd all just study. We could go to growing up school and learn how to, how to do that. But it's not intellectual. It's not a matter of doing. It's a matter of being. It's a matter of changing who you are at the fundamental level, not changing how you act, but changing who you are. And for most of us, that doesn't change a whole lot. That's a slow, that's a very slow thing to change. I see. So for, for someone who grows up and whose uh, quality of consciousness is at the top 0.1% of the people on planet earth, is there another place that they go you, you talked about the done reality another pmr mm -hmm. um i know there's a, some people elected to go there then it was boring they didn't grow up they started de-evolving so but for people that are have a elevated quality of consciousness we're talking about the people who i've made videos about ascended masters mm -hmm. um is there another place that they're going to go are they going to continue to incarnate maybe in another virtual reality or pmr well, for the most part, they will come right back here. Really? This, this idea that you, um, you know, you graduate from here and, and move on. You don't have to, you don't have to return to the, to the uh, cycle of, of um, how is it the Buddha say it? Uh, well, anyway, you don't have to put up with the, with the, uh, uh, Cycle of life and death, birth and death. Or real, yeah, there was another real dharma. Thing. Yeah, something like that. But anyway, you don't have you don't have to be part of that anymore. Well, mm -hmm. it's true. You don't have to be part of that anymore because you've outgrown it. But it doesn't mean that you can't be of help mm -hmm. here. You see, so even if you don't come here to evolve, you come here to help others evolve then you want to be, you need to be doing something useful. If you're not doing something that's useful, you will start to de-evolve yourself. Lowering entropy uh, is one of those things that you can never get to zero. And, you know, you get asymptotic. That's a math word that says you can get closer and closer and closer and closer, but you never actually get there. It's like trying to get to infinity or trying to get to absolute zero in temperature, trying to get absolute, uh, zero in entropy, you have to keep putting work in. As soon as you stop putting work in toward that reduction of entropy, your entropy will start to grow. Okay? Entropy just happens. If you're not actively working on it, it's going to start to grow. That's, that's the nature of it. So you always have to be part of the solution. You're always looking for some way to help. So when you grow up and you're at the top you know, one tenth to one percent, 
then you need to do two things. You need to keep working on it yourself, otherwise you'll de-evolve. But the other thing is you want to keep working on it. That's what you want to do. You don't want to escape from this place where everybody is, has such a low quality of consciousness. You want to be helpful. In other words, you grow up by becoming love. Love is about what can I give? How can I help? You see, so this idea of, wow, I'm going to get out of here. I don't want to be in this stinking place anymore with all these rotten people who are so ungrown that they're always doing hurtful and hateful and nasty things to each other. I just don't want to be a part of this anymore. Well, that sounds like I, 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 I. It doesn't sound like somebody who's really grown up. Somebody that's all about how can I help. It's like, wow, look at all these people. They really need a lot of help. I could see I could be of some use here, you see. So if you really are at that very top end of, of low entropy, then what you want to do is to help at a place where you can be the most help. How can I you know, do the most good, be the most help? Now, there are other reality systems where you could go to other reality systems. You wouldn't have to stay in this one. There may be some others that even need more help than we do. But basically, what you want to do is serve. You want to be someplace where you're constantly challenged about making good choices and where your choices end up being helpful to people. That is the key thing that you want to do. It's not like you want to go sit on a cloud and play a harp and not have to deal with any of the dirty, unwashed masses. You see, that's a very arrogant, non-grown-up attitude. So there is no merging back with the consciousness kind of like in the law of one, I don't know if you ever heard of the law of one Ra, but you go through these eight densities and when you get the eighth density, you merge back with the source, yeah. something like Buddhism, yeah. Buddhism, Hinduism say something similar. O only metaphorically, okay? The way that you merge back with the source is not literally. After all, the source broke itself apart into individuated units because that helped it evolve. It, it gave it a more complex, mind space to play in that it could evolve to. So, you know, going back into it is just the opposite stream. That's not really what makes the system, uh, you know, more effective. I mean, it's already had to make a lot of pieces. Now, if the pieces all come back, it's going to end up being stuck eventually back at one monolithic thing again with nowhere to go. You see, that's not really on the place to progress. But now metaphorically, so that's where people they hear things, but they take it literally. And it's, if you don't think of it literally, think of it metaphorically. Well, you do become one with the whole because you become just like the whole. You now become a very low entropy, high quality piece of consciousness. What's the LCS? It's a very low entropy, high quality piece of consciousness. So metaphorically, you do become one, you become very similar to the LCS. Well, you're not necessarily the uh, operating system for a, you know, for a big reality frame or something, but you get to the quality that is in the same, you know, you're playing in the same playground as the LCS as far as its own development goes. So in that way, metaphorically, yes, you kind of become one with all that is because you and all that is now see eye to eye, understand things at about the same level. Okay, so that's true. But it doesn't mean that you, you know, you meld back, you know, we look at it kind of, of um, you know, concretely rather than metaphorically, that this person, this entity just emerges into the other one and disappears into that. Now it's just the larger conscious system just has one more, you know, I don't know, something extra. But no, you, you're better with a social system that has a lot of parts. Because why? Why would the system want to do that? The system needs entities that are very grown. I mean, after all, they can come here and help. They can be good examples. They can, they can be, do so much good. So why would it, you know, it's like you've, you've taken somebody in your factory. They started at the janitor. You've worked them all the way up to where they know the company so well that they know every bit of it and part of it and every customer. And they're like, so now what you want to do is throw them out. Get rid of them. You're too old to be here anymore. 
you know, or, um, you know, we want, we want to start over with somebody who doesn't know anything. No, when you have somebody that's, that's valuable, even if they don't want to be CEO anymore, wow, they could help any of the other departments do better because they have such a big holistic understanding of what's going on. So that, that's your, you know, you develop that, I don't know, equity, you know, you develop that, that value in consciousness. You don't want to erase it or absorb it. You want to put it to work. So the system doesn't want to absorb you when you get to be low entropy. The system would like to tell you, would like to help you, know, you do what you want to do, which is get back in there and be of use, be of help. That's what makes the system go. It's not a matter of you get out of, you get out of this mess and then uh, you know, you know, meld back into the system. And I think uh, even in, in, in Buddhism, you know, they had, to, they had to play some politics too, just like every other religion. If you don't, if you're not uh, looking at your PR, you're, you're not going to have as, uh, as uh, broad an organization. And when you tell people who are down at the struggling level with high, you know, high entropy, low quality of consciousness, and say, well, you're going you're gonna to work and work and work until you finally get to the point where you can work, work, and work some more. It's not very appealing. You see, people want to know that they're going to graduate and something wonderful is going to happen. That's what we're working for, right? So we can graduate and something wonderful can happen. Well, that's just ego. People who feel like that still have a lot of ego. It's about them. They want to graduate. They want to get out into this better space. They want to go to heaven. They want to do whatever, you see. But that's not what it's like when you get rid of that ego. When you get rid of that ego, you don't want to get out. You want to help. You want to be a part of the solution. And, I mean, we are not suffering from too many low entropy people. <laughs> We're not suffering here because there's just too many of us that, uh, you know, have really high quality. We could use a whole lot more good examples, you know, and high quality here would be very useful. It's just that, you know, again, it's slow growing. So only a few people get there every year. You know, there's dozens maybe or whatever, but it's just, you know, they pop out and they come back and they help. And that's part of why the system keeps getting better, keeps getting better. I would imagine you're one of those people. And I thank you for sharing, you know, this message to everybody. And I, I guess, I guess one of my questions is, even though you, you have attained a high level of consciousness and you're spreading the message of love and oneness and MBT, do you still have fears that you have to work on personally? Well, yes, I do. Um, not so much of the usual fears that most people work on, but I constantly, just like anyone else, have to keep working or I will slip backwards. So if I, if I ever got to the point that I said, well, I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm uh, what's, what's the word for that? Oh, I'm uh, enlightened now and I'm done. That would be the time that I would start de-evolving. You, you don't get there. If you, if you are, really happy now because you've become enlightened. That just tells you that you're not really enlightened because you wouldn't feel that way if you were, you see. So yes, there are things I have to keep working on. I have to keep working on, on uh, it's not so much a, a fear as it is, you know, seeing the world from my own perspective. You have to always be, be wary of yourself. You have to always stay skeptical of yourself. You have to never get too enamored or too, uh, um, uh, what can I say, uh, too dependent on, you know, the knowledge that you are a low entropy person. It's like, yeah, so what? What matters isn't what I've done. What matters is the next choice I make. I have to reflect that, that low entropy in every choice I make. And if I don't pay attention, I just kind of make the choice without thinking about it because I feel very confident that my choices are all going to be good ones. Then I start making bad choices that aren't as good as they could be. 
Now, maybe they're not really terrible choices. They're just not as optimal as they could be had I thought about it and done it a little differently. So you kind of, you set the, you know, the bar that you have to jump over keeps getting higher and higher. Once you evolve to, you know, if you start at level A, once you evolve up to B, then your, your, your lessons get a little harder and your responsibility gets a little greater. And then you evolve up to C and D and E and F and so on. Your lessons always are getting a little harder, but they're really at the same level. They're right at the level you need to grow up. So the things you can look downstream and see the things that a lot of people are struggling with, well, you're not struggling with that anymore, but you've got your own lessons and you always have to stay watchful. You always have to look at yourself and make sure that, you know, you're not just saying this because this is the way you think it should be. You're not telling people. You have to be very careful that you don't ever give people, what, advice. All you do is give them alternatives. You help them see bigger pictures. You never tell them what to do. And sometimes you're tempted. Oh, they just need to know this, you know, but that doesn't, it's not useful. It's useful to tell them things that will help them get to that point on their own. So if you, if you tend to butt in and, and want to fix things, then that's a problem. You can need to be helpful but you have to let other people make their own choices in their own way. And you need to have a lot of empathy for the fact that they're struggling. They're doing the best they can. The, that's just where they are in their evolutionary path. And they're doing the best they can with it. And uh, even if you see that it's very suboptimal, you try to help. Not by giving them the answer or telling them how they ought to live their life, but just making maybe just make them feel better. Sometimes that's all they need is somebody to hold their hand, you know, for a little bit, give them some confidence. So finding, finding better ways and more effective ways to help people is my challenge. I have challenges with that and I don't always find the best way. Sometimes I'll look back on it and say, uh, yep, I should have, <laughs> I should have not done it that way. Oh, it worked out all right, but it could have worked out a lot better had I approached it a different way. Or I did this, and yeah, it worked on the thing I was thinking about worked pretty good, but there was some side issues, some trouble it caused, some confusion that it caused. How could I have done that and gotten the same positive result with less confusion? So I'm constantly trying to optimize being helpful, and I don't always do it the best way. I find, you know, I, I, hindsight's always twenty twenty, as they say, and you have to keep learning. You have to look at it and learn and say, well, okay, that wasn't a good idea. We'll do it differently next time. But just like everybody else, you have a tendency to repeat your mistakes until you've repeated them enough <laughs> that it kind of gets through your thick skull that you're, you know, that you need to stop it. So it's, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just all done at a little different level with different stuff. The lessons keep getting tougher and tougher, you know, so it's a tougher lesson to try to optimize all your interactions with people than it is just to say, stop being angry. That's a, that's a simpler thing. But as you get over anger, then your lessons get a little harder. Do you still experience like anger or frustration? If you like stub your toe, if you're in traffic or something like that? No, not anymore, but I did, you know, I did all that stuff, but I can't really remember the last time I got angry. I think I got I got really angry once when I don't know anger. I got I, last time I ever remember being angry was probably when I was a teenager. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's probably a teenager, probably even a young teenager. I got I really I got angry, but that you know I don't get angry much. Um, sometimes I'll find myself. Uh, uh, oh, being inconvenienced by something, you know, and, and that may turn into a little annoyance, which isn't good because you just need to live with that. You know, okay, I'm going to this meeting and, oh, you know, a train goes across the tracks and stops all the traffic and I was just going to make it on time and now, you know, and I'm the presenter and I'm going to be late. And uh, 
Well, so you get a little annoyed with that, but really the annoyance is with yourself. Well, why didn't I figure on that and go 10 minutes earlier? Or, well, that's life. Sometimes, sometimes the, talk, the, speech, the guy who's making the speech comes in late and we just start a little late. You know, it's, it's not a big deal. So you, you need to, to deal with it, but immediately you might get a little self-recrimination rather than just dealing with it positively. So those, those are those kinds of things that uh, I have. But no, I don't get angry. I don't get angry in traffic. I just let traffic be however it is. I, I move with the flow. I don't go too slow. I don't go too fast. I just kind of go the way most people are going because that's the safest way, you know, not to cause an accident for somebody else. And I'm patient. I mostly, uh, I don't really have to be any place in any particular time. So I, I can relax and I, I'm not that pushed anymore. I'm a retired guy now. So I don't, I don't have a lot of meetings that I'm late for. I was going to ask you this. Um, I'm sure that many of my viewers, and I've seen the questions in the comments section, they want to know how they can increase their power. How can they have remote viewing experiences? How can they have out-of-body experiences? I know some of that is from ego, but you started 40 years ago on this with Robert Monroe. And what would you suggest? Like, I know we only have a few minutes left in the interview, but like in five minutes or less, what would, what would you suggest to my viewers, even to myself, where should we start? Is it meditation? How often should we do it? Is it 10 minutes, 20 minutes a day, twice a day? What, what, we, what do we need to do to Im improve our consciousness in that regard? Uh, okay. Maybe not improve what? the quality of our consciousness, but level up our power. Okay, I would say uh, I've just published not that long ago uh, a, a, uh, an immersive that I did. An immersive is called Exploring the Larger Conscious System with Thomas Campbell. That's the immersive we give. And I basically am teaching people how to remote view, how to heal, you know, how to get data out of databases and this sort of thing. And I videotape all of that and all of the questions and answers and so on. And it's out there on YouTube. So everything I have to say about it, all the instructions, things not to do, things to do, what to look out for, these people doing it, having issues, coming back, asking questions, you know, and me, you know, giving, coaching them on how to get past the issues. That I think would be about as good a thing as you could do. And people paid, I don't know, $2,500, $3,000 to attend the course, but it's all on YouTube. It's all for free. And this wasn't a TMI course. This was, I used the TMI facility. So it was a, it was a Tom Campbell course. And so it's, I can, I can put it out there for free. You know, it's not a TMI course. It's not there. We're not overriding somebody's uh, ownership here. So it's out on YouTube. And then I had had another TMI course where I did a similar thing. And there's a lot out there already, but the last one was done in November, 2019. So if they look up TMI, November, 2019, they'll probably find this. It's long because it went five, you know, five days, four whole days in, a, in an evening. So there's many hours there, but if they just go through it slowly, they will find about everything that I would possibly tell them if we took the next five or six hours to discuss this subject. It's all there, plus the questions that those people ask. So that's what I tell them to do. Just go look up that YouTube video and spend some months with it. Well, that, it's great that yeah. you've, uh, you've done that. So we're about the time right now. Yeah, we are. The interview. And I just want to say, Tom, if you want to, if you want to mention uh, your books or any other thing you want to mention to my audience before we go. Well, I like as far as books go, you can get them all the usual places. I think even Amazon started shipping books again. Um, you can get it for free. I like to tell people always, you can get it for free on Google Books. Uh, that's the very first uh, edition that came out in 2003. It's on Google Books. I put it there at 100%. It's been there ever since. Um, you go to, to YouTube. I have thousands and thousands of hours on YouTube. Um, there's Facebook pages you can go to. Uh, just, you know, take your time. The only thing I would like to tell them is do it slowly. It's not something you can rush. Do it slowly. Right. I think um, if, if I was going to tell my viewers to start, I really like the Portland, the Vancouver and the Portland you did. That was great. Yeah, there was one in... Um, yeah, 
Vancouver, that one of the things I did called workshops. If you want a general overview, go to the workshops. I did one of those in Marseille, France, that was pretty recent. And I did the original one in uh, Canada, um, Calgary, Calgary workshop. Both of those will give you an overview of my work. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to go because it's four o'clock and I've got another two hour interview. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, Tom, so much for being on the show and um, take care. You're welcome.